family roots. I'm Chuck Mason. With me today is my co-host Janelle Blue. Janelle is president of the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society, which sponsors us. And today our guest is Jerry Ward. Jerry is the chairman of the Mount Vernon Research Center. In the past, we have done a show or a couple of shows, I think, with Leslie Anderson from the Alexandria Special Collections Library. And we have had the Virginia Room, the Fairfax Genealogy Collection, a number of times. So we decided we're going to move to home, to our own library. So welcome, Jerry. We're glad that you could join us. Thank you for having me. I don't know that there are very many people who know about our little gem of a library at the Holland Hall Center in Alexandria, but um, it's, it's great that we're going to be able to talk about this a little bit because yes. I think there are viewers out there that will find that it's really handy and, and with lots of good resources. We're Bef not trying to keep it a secret. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a wonderful resource. And it's open to the public. So yes. Um, and one of the things, it's often said, good things come in small packages. And when we were talking to Jerry earlier this week about this, a classic example, we have a family genealogy that a man found on Google that we were all one of only two libraries in the country that had that book and contacted us and we were able to provide him with the information that he needed. So even though it's a small library, you know, it's in an old school, that's where the center is. So it's a classroom in the 1950s, 1960s. It's full of good information. And you never yeah. know what we might have because folks have donated a lot of their Thanks. collections over the over the years to to our library and so we do have a card catalog that you would be able to look at. But first let's talk about Jerry a little bit. How did you get started in genealogy? Well, I've always been interested in my family history and when we would gather in West Virginia, that's my Scottish side of the family, and my great or my grandmother was German, from German descent. We would have family gatherings. Uh, my brother and I mostly were city dwellers, so when we got to go back to West Virginia to visit our cousins who lived in the country, it, it was very exciting. So. We would hide underneath the kitchen table after dinner and listen to my aunts and uncles talk about what they did as children growing up my there. Gosh. And it was, I loved it. What a rare opportunity to have that. Most of it us, was, you know, didn't really have relatives who wanted to talk about all those things. Oh, well, my, almost all of my relatives are still alive, although most of my my, all of my aunts and uncles ha are deceased, but mm -hmm. all the cousins are still there. And actually, I was, uh, I had people available to talk to up until maybe five years ago. So I got a, a lot more information knowing better what questions mm -hmm. to ask, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just listening as a kid. When did you really get serious and start to, to do what, we, what, what we're doing today as genealogists? Around 2006. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't even know how I found out that there was a Mount Vernon genealogy group, but somehow I did, and then I found out about Fairfax, so I immediately joined both groups because they, have different things to offer. Yes, they do. And when I first got started, I had help. People just jump right in there. If you ask them a question, they drag you off to uh, National Archives and help you get started there. How nice. Yes, wonderful. That's when I first found the immigration records for my great grandfather and uh, then came back to our Mount Vernon Library and Sharon Hodges helped me go through census records. So I was totally hooked by that time and started doing a lot of research at home and volunteered at the library as one of the computer people. And then later on, the more 
I went to the meetings and got involved in taking education classes. Uh, people started, or a person, uh, the, the library person started looking for somebody to take over. Aha. Uh, and first, somebody asked me would I do membership, and I thought, no, I'm not that crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so then the girl that was in the library who you know, knew me and I knew her said, will you, will you do it? And I said, well, yeah, I'll try so long as you stay in the picture uh -huh. you know, and can help me along the way. So that's sort of how I got started. And that was how many years ago? Uh, about four years ago. Great. Yeah. It's fun. It's a challenge, but, and it's a little library, but there are some really amazing things in the library. And you really start learning what's there when you get a whole stack of books that somebody has donated uh. and you've got to catalog them and put them back on the shelf. Well, that can be very dangerous because when you start putting things back on the shelf, your eyes wander <laughs> to the things that are next to it. Oh my gosh, I need to read this. This is wonderful. So it's fun. I like it. I've always told people, when, when you get tired, your eyes get tired, or you've hopefully found everything you went there, just look at the shelves oh, and yeah. see what's there, the file folders. Or I found probably almost as much that way as I have things that I purposely knew I was going and looking for. Mm -hmm. And how did Mount Vernon get started, the library get started, do you know? It wasn't really an accident, but back in 1991, the group started because they were in a senior center and the senior center wanted somebody, one of our members, an older member, said he, he agreed to teach a genealogy class. And that's how that got started. And it just evolved from there. And they started growing and growing and growing until they had like 40 members in 1994. And then they realized, you know, they weren't collecting money because they couldn't. Fairfax said you couldn't collect money. But eventually they found out, yes, you could collect money. So then they could collect dues and then they could have a more of an organization and it evolved from there. And people donate books all the time. Yeah. Do you know how the library got yeah. started? Little by little, after they started getting money, they, well, they were in a classroom. They, they made the group that had taught the genealogy course, they put them in a classroom upstairs, which is actually our library right now. Uh -huh. So well. from 1991 to now, we've been in that same classroom. Actually, it started a little bit different. I've been a member since 97. Okay. Ann Hanley, who was the original librarian, had an old microwave cart that somebody donated, and they had books stored in that, and she used to wheel that into the meeting room. Ah. That was the original library, and then it started to grow, and they outgrew the microwave cart, and that's when they, they started with just, I think, initially a few bookcases in the room, and mm -hmm. eventually we just took over the whole room. And, and now it's and grown. Now it's exclusively it, ours. It was a slow process, I think, yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. But but now it's grown to how many in the collection? Uh, oh, in the collection, around 3,000 3, 3, books. Documents, wow. And periodicals. Uh-huh. So. So that, that we've had to have many hand carts That's to <laughs> be able to handle that. Well, <laughs> people donated not only books, but bookcases and maps and uh, periodicals, periodicals and, yeah. um, desks, yes, tables, so. chairs, yep. whatever you can think of that you might need in a library. And we were, Almost we were, all of it was Aren't donated. we about ready to, uh, we're kind of outgrowing it, aren't we? Well, there's been some discussion about <laughs> whether we could move, where we could move, but we're still trying to streamline it so we have space for more books. Yeah, because so, yeah, we don't really want to move. No. Uh, the, 
Gee whiz. <laughs> the <laughs> cost, the, like the, the cost of just finding a place is, mm -hmm. is really a little prohibitive. Tell us some of the interesting um, books that you have in the collection. Uh, well, we have, we're not just for Virginia. People may think that yeah. we mm. are just a Virginia library and just Virginia genealogy. That's not true. Uh, we cover the entire United States, Europe, wherever people can come from, we have something in that library about that location mm -hmm. or those people. Uh, the library is basically separated into sort of four areas. One area is a bank of computers and we have access to like four of the large major websites and Databases. numerous, numerous newspaper databases. And then uh, another section of the library deals with states, anything to do with states, including, including wills, probate, um, family histories, that sort of thing. Then the other side of the library would deal with anything that refers to countries or general genealogy or how to do things. And then the center of the room is all periodicals. Mm -hmm. Periodicals, pamphlets, leaflets. And we have a couple of drawers, lateral files that are individuals who have done research on their families and those are in our libraries. So there is access to that information. Uh, it's generally considered like a surname project. It's connected with that. So if you have a, a particular name that you're looking for, which also on our website, we have a listing of like 1,500 surnames that people are looking at. Wow. And those can be, some of those can be accessed in our library. So some of our more interesting or newer acquisitions, we had a donation of pamphlets it's called Research in the States by National Ge Genealogical Society. Those, each booklet covers one state and how to research in that state. And some of them are better than others I think mostly because states have different laws mm -hmm. and what kind of records they keep and how we access them. So depending upon what the states are that you're looking for, you may have great success using those booklets because they're chock full of information. Well, but they're especially, I'm sorry. That's okay. They're especially useful if you are just getting started on yeah. that state too. Absolutely. Because, um, because it, it gives you a little background on the state, mm -hmm. some of the laws, some of the history. Mm -hmm. um, but, but more than that, it gives you where to find all the different documents. That's true. And they, some of the states, it's probably getting a little out of date, but most of them, they, you know, they, re, they will revise those periodically yeah, they've, too. They've yeah, revised them. The, the project is planned to eventually have one for all of the states. And also they have some, I know they have New York City, a separate one from mm -hmm. New York. But part of the problem is finding knowledgeable people to write them. Mm -hmm. You know, these, these are people who have a great deal of knowledge about the areas and finding those people and finding someone who has the time because it is, is a commitment of time. I, I just read the, the uh, final, or when they were finalizing the New Jersey Guide and did a little bit of input there. And that, I think, was like a six to nine month project of that sure. person working on it, yeah. you know, almost full time to put it together. Yeah. Well, there's so. an awful lot of information there. Mm -hmm. A lot yeah. of websites. Yes. I think it's a great tool. It is. Uh, each booklet is roughly 45 pages. Mm -hmm. So it's not overwhelming. And it's not all the states have been 
Done not yet. A, no, we have about 26. And actually, one of those booklets uh, concerns American Indians. Uh -huh, so yeah. there's other things there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, we do have all of the um, updated editions. So anything Good. that's been updated since they originally published, some yeah. of them have been revised three yeah. and four times. Originally, how they actually got started was when they were holding a conference, one of their national conferences in a particular state, they had someone write an article for the quarterly about research so people would see it in the quarterly and be familiar with you know, all the research facilities and how the record keeping systems were in the state where the conference was going to be and that would be published beforehand and then I don't know how many conferences they had before they decided, you know, it would be good to publish these as a separate book. And so that's how the whole series got started. And like I say, they're, they're working on them. They're, they're no longer just doing the conference uh, ones because like New Jersey, they didn't. There's never been a, an NGS conference in New Jersey. So, so with the computers, what are the major uh, resources that we have on there? Uh, American Ancestors and Ancestry. Uh, my United heritage. States edition or the worldwide world, edition? I'm sorry, world, the world edition, actually. Yes. And since Ancestry has bought up a lot of other concerns, they have newspapers.com and three. Fold3. And so we have access to those two. And um, find a grave? Find a grave. But find a grave is free. Yeah. Yeah. But you do need a... It is right now. It is right you now. Know, we don't know what may happen down True. the road. True. But we have access to that. We have access to uh, the family history centers, the, the research search. and family search. And actually, <clears throat> our group is trying to become an affiliate of that organization, sure. which would allow us to have access to even more materials on the internet mm -hmm. that, uh, that we couldn't find without going to a family history center. Right, but that's kind of in process right that's now. That's in we, process, yeah. but I have hopes that that's actually gonna happen. So do you have volunteers? We do. We're open three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 10 until two. And we have two volunteers each day, and one is supposed to be uh, a computer person, and the other is dealing with the library side. But honestly, anybody can help you do anything, because everybody we've tried to learn to do both sides. So in case somebody's mm -hmm. sick, you still have someone to help you. Mm -hmm. So they're there strictly to help people that walk in and need help. And so, just to sort of set the expectation about needing help or mm -hmm. getting help, are you talking about kind of getting them onto a database or thinking through what would be the things that they want to, it's not like we're gonna solve their genealogical no. question. No, usually if somebody's coming in for the first time, and we do get a lot of new people that have never done anything, although some people come in with you know, a notebook full of tidbits from the family, but they haven't actually done any research. Mm -hmm. So we sit down with them and we ask them, where are you? What have you already done? Uh, and what do you want to do? So after we've asked them those questions, then we talk about what places they need to go to just sort of give them, uh, get them excited about it, although mm -hmm. they're already there, so mm -hmm. there, you know, there mm -hmm. is some excitement. That's a big yeah. plus. But we also want them to find something that first visit this, that's exciting for them and that will bring them back. Mm -hmm. So we try to help them find at least one thing that links to some of the information they have. 
Now, is the library only open to members? No. Okay. Uh, we, since we're in a senior center, and anybody actually can walk in. We'll help anybody. Of course, we encourage people to join our society. Uh, but no, anybody can, can come in and we'll help them. And is the library a circulating library? Can people borrow materials? Or? Only if you're a member. Okay. And we do have things that are non-circulating, either they're too fragile or, uh, you know, they're like one of a kind. kind. Uh, there's not too many of those, but it is possible that it's something we don't circulate. But mostly we do. Now, we're not an interlibrary loan. Mm -hmm. but we do let members check out volumes. Mm -hmm. but, but we don't do that a lot because it's hard to keep up with. No, we keep track of it, actually. Okay. Yeah. Just like a regular library. Uh -huh. We don't have a computer that checks you out, but we do have a log and we know exactly every book that's out and who has it. Uh -huh. Great. And there's an expectation that you return it within two weeks. Mm -hmm. How's that going? <laughs> uh, probably 80% it works. Good. <laughs> and then we try to follow up if somebody looks like they've kept something out for a while. Yeah. But yeah, it works. It's, it works. Well, I, um, you know, I just think that this is something that m many genealogical societies don't have. So I think we have a, a real treasure yeah in that and it's amazing the number of volunteers who faithfully come in every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday and are, you know, very happy to help people mm -hmm. uh, work on their on their research. So it's it's a wonderful resource. Uh, and again, you don't have to be a member. We we wish you would be, but mm -hmm. you don't have to be a member uh, to that's, to use it. That's true. And actually when we were getting started on our new website at that time, there were probably around 200 uh, people that he, not people, but groups that he was doing websites for. And mm -hmm. out of that 200, there were probably less than 16 of those sites that actually had a, a research center or a library. Mm -hmm. Mm. And of those, most of them were actually in a public library that had given them space. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty unique, actually. So Jerry, if somebody wants to know what's in the library, we have a card catalog, right? Yes. So yes. how would they access that card catalog? Well, every book that we have is in a database, and that database is on our website. and all of those items are searchable, either mm -hmm. by title, call number, subject, a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. But you can pull it up. Anybody can look at it. You don't have to be a member. You can search for a book that you want to see, and it may or may not be in our library. And th that's mvgenealogy.org, right? Yes. And then you, I think there's, it's on the screen there Website. where um, you yes. can go to... Um, the resources it, tab. it will be listed on the left side as the research center and then if you click on the research center uh, you'll have a drop down menu and it'll have online catalog mm -hmm. click on that and then down at the very bottom of that page it will say click here do that and it opens up that particular database it's also interesting that uh, when you're on the website, uh, we do have a link to the National Archives as well. We do. Um, it's not on that page, but we have a link to the National Archives and Library of Congress. Library of, Library of Congress, and there was one other. There's three. So it's a pretty handy website to go on. Yes. Uh, if you're if you're looking for resources. Yes, and it's. Um, actually very easy to use. It's user friendly. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the unique things about a small library is it's less intimidating if you're just getting started. You know, to go, well even sometimes to the Virginia Room, but to go to the Library of Congress, 
you know, first of all, to find the right room that you want yeah. to go to. But there's, there's so much in our collection to get started that, you know, if you're intimidated about going to research facilities, I know I was mm -hmm. when, when I was new, and part of what got me to going to archives and libraries was taking the National Genealogical Society's Home Study Course, where you mm -hmm. had to go out and do things. Right. But, but having the small library and the collection and the volunteers that that we have mm -hmm. have there. Uh, I'm usually there the first Wednesday afternoon because I do a group after the library closes. But you know, sometimes I see the same people coming back time after time after time, getting help by the staff. So. Well, I just like to put a plug in for our organization um, anyway. So we have general meetings that are the third Tuesday of every month. We have a speaker. Usually it's somebody that's nationally known in the genealogical world, and they speak on a variety of topics. Um, in fact, John Coletta is going to be here uh, speaking to us Tuesday, which is after this is going to be um, viewed, but um, he's going to be talking about states. And you, we were talking about mm -hmm. the books, uh, the state's books. Um, every state has something a little different in the way they took vital records, in, in where they store their records, mm -hmm. in what you might find. And when so, they started them. Yeah, when you know. they started them. And so mm -hmm. it's really useful to go to that state guide. Also, if you can get a hold of lectures that you know have that help you with that, it's it's really useful too. The, everyone is welcome to um, become a visitor uh, our, of our meetings, and then of course we're going to encourage you to join because for the low price of twenty dollars a year, you can become a member and take advantage of a lot more than what we've talked about today. But um, we we. Jerry, thank you so much yes. for, for being you here for today. Me. This is really yeah. uh, interesting, and I'm so glad that our viewers have a chance to really learn about mm -hmm. this wonderful library that we have that's kind of tucked away in Alexandria. It's our like volunteers are very friendly, and they will love to help people. And like I said, you never know what you're going to find in that small collection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, that's right, because... People from all over the United States move here, and then they, many times, they're, you know, closing down housekeeping, mm -hmm. and so they they donate their books to us. Well, thank you for joining us, Jerry. Thank we you very appreciate much. Appreciate you, you coming.